Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome to the EKG of the Week. I hope you're having a great week, and I'm glad you could join us. So this week's case is an 85-year-old male with myasthenia gravis that presents with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. His recent EKG is shown here. Now, before we get started, let's review the approach we've been using to interpret EKGs. So notice we have the patient's clinical presentation and then the EKG below. On the right side of the screen, you'll find that we have a list that we'll go through before we make our final interpretation. First, we'll look at the regularity of the rhythm. That is, are we dealing with a regular or irregular rhythm? And if it's irregular, is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Next, we have the heart rate, in which we simply want to determine what the rate of the rhythm is. Then we'll look at what the rhythm origin is. That is, is it a rhythm that's originating from uh, within the atria, the AV node, or from the ventricles? Then we'll look at looking how to find the ventricular or QRS axis, which will help us with our differential diagnosis. Then there is the atrial, atrioventricular, or and intraventricular conduction. Looking at is conduction within all these normal or abnormal. Then we'll look at the waveforms, which is, includes all the waves, the segments and intervals, and lastly, anything else. Meaning, is there anything else that we've missed or still need to mention? After that, we'll use all this information we've gathered to make our final interpretation of the EKG. Now I want you to pause the video, take a few minutes to go through it yourself. When you're ready, start it, and then we'll go through this together. Okay, so our 85-year-old male with a history of myasthenia gravis presents with acute hypoxic respiratory failure in this EKG. So let's go through it now. First, we have to see what is the regularity of this rhythm. Well, on first impression, you probably notice that the EKG in the rhythm here appears irregular. Not only irregular, but irregularly irregular. Okay, so how do we look at the regularity of the rhythm? Okay, so what the main thing and one of the easiest way we've been doing it is by finding the R waves. Okay, so if we look at this uh, V5 down here in the rhythm strip, so here's one R wave and look to the next one. So that's called an R to R interval. Okay. And then from this R wave to the next R wave here would be the next R to R interval. And we're looking to see if those intervals are consistent throughout. Okay. Are they in equal duration? Okay. So from this to this, and then we would look from this R wave to the next, and you can clearly see that these are not the same duration okay from one r wave to the next and if you went throughout this whole rhythm you would see that we have different r to r intervals throughout all of these okay so because this is an irregular rhythm okay there's no regularity to the r to r intervals and there's no regularity whatsoever if you look at this whole um across the whole, whole EKG, we call this an irregularly irregular rhythm okay so we will write this here so irregularly irregular okay so what do you get for the heart rate? Well, because we have an irregular rhythm, we can estimate the heart rate by adding up the complexes going across the EKG and then multiplying that number by six, okay? That means because this whole EKG represents 10 seconds. So from the beginning all the way to the end here, this is 10 seconds. So if we multiply 10 seconds by six, we get 60 seconds, okay? And 60 seconds is one minute. So if we count the complexes going across, we can multiply that by six and get the beats per minute. So let's try that now. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, okay, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18. Okay, so we have 18 complexes that we can make out going across. So we said we would take 18 and then we multiply that number by six, which gives us 108 beats per minute. Okay, now the actual EKG machine uh, gave us a reading of 105. Okay, so quite close. It's a good estimate. All right, so we have a rate of 105 beats per minute, which is a faster rate above 100. Now, let's look at the underlying rhythm origin. Well, it appears that we can't really make out any clear P waves here, and the QRS complexes appear like they may be wide, so we may be dealing with a ventricular rhythm. However, because the rhythm is irregularly irregular, it's more likely that we have some chaotic supraventricular activity, okay? So in terms of the rhythm here, what we're gonna say is that it's likely originating from a supraventricular source, okay? Okay, because it's irregularly irregular is the uh, rhythm or the regularity that we saw here. Now, when we look at the ventricular or QRS axis, you should have gotten a normal QRS axis. The actual axis here was positive 
47 degrees, which is within normal limits, okay? So this is a normal axis. So how do we find axis, okay? Now, if you look down here, if we label this as zero degrees, this is our positive 90 degrees, this would be plus or minus 180 degrees, and this is negative 90 degrees, okay? Now, lead one's positive end sits here, AVF sits down here at positive 90, okay? So we'll use these leads, one and AVF, to help us find where the axis lies. Normal axis lies here between negative 30 degrees in positive 105 degrees in adults, okay? As we get older, it shifts more leftward. So this would be the normal axis range, okay? This would be a rightward axis deviation or shift. This is a leftward shift, and this is that extreme axis, okay? Rarely seen, sometimes seen in VTAC, okay? So let's find the axis here. We'll look at lead one, and lead one right here is mostly positive and upright, okay? If you measured from the top to the bottom, or even here in this one, okay, you would see that it's mostly positive, okay, slightly more positive. So we're heading towards the positive end of lead one. When we look at AVF, okay, you can clearly see that this is mostly a positive uh, QRS complex, okay? If you look here, it's mostly positive. So we're heading towards AVF. So that means the axis lies actually somewhere between lead one and AVF, okay? The actual axis we said was positive 47 degrees, which comes out to be right here, okay? So this is approximately positive 47 degrees. So within our normal limits, we have a normal ventricular axis. Now, how about atrial conduction? Well, because we can't make out any clear P waves and the P waves represent atrial depolarization, there is no clear atrial conduction here, okay? But it may actually be that chaotic atrial activity that we were thinking was going on above, okay? So in this case, uh, we can't make out any clear activity, okay? But it may be some chaotic atrial conduction, okay? Or we'll put atrial activity. All right, so now let's move on to atrial ventricular or AV conduction. Well, again, we don't have any clear P waves, so there's no clear PR interval. So again, no clear AV nodal conduction, okay? So we will just put an X here. Now remember, when we talk about the PR interval and why we're saying we can't find it if we draw out our complex here, this being our P wave, this is our QRS complex, and T wave, the PR intervals from the beginning of our P wave to the beginning of our QRS complex, okay? So if we can't make out any P wave, how can we make out any PR interval? We can't, okay? So no AV conduction uh, that we can see here. Next, we have intraventricular or IV conduction, okay? In this case, we're gonna look at the duration of the QRS complexes. Normal QRS duration is often between 70 and 110 milliseconds, or about two to three small boxes. The main thing we're looking for here is, is the intraventricular conduction prolonged or not, okay? The QRS complexes do appear wide here. In fact, the QRS duration was 132 milliseconds, so that helps to confirm that we have prolonged IV conduction. Okay, so when we talk about this, we're looking at the duration from the beginning of our QRS complex here to the end of it, okay? We said normally it's between 70 and 110 milliseconds. In this case, it's prolonged. It was 132 milliseconds, okay? So we have prolonged uh, intraventricular conduction, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Now, how about the waveforms? Well, the P waves we mentioned, we couldn't make out, okay? And therefore we couldn't make out a PR interval. There are no pathological Q waves or QS complexes. The QRS complexes are of normal amplitude. However, there does seem to appear to be these RSR prime complexes in lead V1, as well as slurred S waves in lead one, which are suggestive of right bundle branch block. And because the QRS interval is prolonged, it's considered complete right bundle bundle branch block. So let's just look at that. That's something you may have picked up. So here's lead V1. Okay. And you can see that there's a small R wave. There's an S wave and an R prime wave. Okay. So if we enlarge it, it looks like this. This is the small R wave, the S wave and the R prime wave. Okay. So we call that an RSR prime complex. Okay. And that's in lead one. You cannot really see these slurred S waves in V6, but if you look at lead one, you can see that these slurred S waves, wide S waves are occurring there, okay? And because we said the QRS width was prolonged, we call this uh, complete 
write bundle branch block. Okay. If the QRS interval was not prolonged, it would be incomplete write bundle branch block. Now you may have also noticed that there is discordance with some of the QRS complexes in T waves, along with ST T wave abnormalities, which are likely secondary to the right bundle branch block. Okay, so if you look at lead V1 here, notice that it's mostly positive upright QRS. Okay, and then you have the T wave here going in the opposite direction. Okay, the same thing in V2, upright QRS, negatively deflected um, in ST depression. Um, and inverted T wave. So that's what we call discordance, okay? Normally the QRS complex and T wave should be going in the same direction, all right? And because of this, this is likely secondary uh, to the right bundle branch block, okay? So we have complete right bundle branch block, okay? And then we have these uh, secondary ST T wave abnormalities. Okay, and they're likely a result of this abnormal repolarization that's going on in the setting of the bundle branch block. Now, one other thing to point out here is that the fifth beat you may have seen is different than its corresponding beats in the same lead. It is wide and has a different morphology, which likely represents a premature ventricular contraction, PVC, or an aberrantly conducted complex. Okay, so if you look here, what I'm saying is that fifth beat, okay, we've already numbered the beat, so it's this one here. So if you look up, these are all occurring at the same time. They have the same temporal relationship, right? If we draw a straight line, everything happens at the same time. If you have this vertical line, okay? So these are all occurring at the same time. And notice how these complexes, for instance, this one here, is different from the four that precede it in the same lead, okay? Same thing here. Look at these. is different than that that comes afterwards, okay? That means this is either a PVC we mentioned, okay? Premature ventricular contraction versus an aberrantly conducted beat, okay? So that's just one thing to uh, point out on this if you didn't see that there, okay? So um, now lastly with the waveforms, we wanna mention something about the QTC interval, okay? The QTC interval is from the beginning of our QRS complex, so meaning from this point up until the end of our T wave, okay? So that's considered our QT interval. When we talk about the QTC interval, oftentimes we'll use a formula called the Bazette formula to adjust for heart rate. Now the normal QTC interval in males is less than 440 milliseconds, okay? We're dealing with a male patient here, and in this case, the QTC interval was 504 uh, milliseconds, so obviously prolonged, okay? So we have a prolonged QTC interval and the interval here we said was 504 milliseconds, okay? Behind that 440 milliseconds that we uh, generally consider the upper limit of normal in males, okay? So is there anything else that we're missing here? Well, how about the R wave progression in the precordial leads? Now, normally the R wave amplitude should progressively increase from lead V1 through V5, all right? However, with this abnormal conduction with the right bundle branch block, it's not always the most useful in this case. Therefore, we're not gonna say much more about about it here, okay? And the same goes for the transitional zone. Remember that when we look at other EKGs, okay, the R wave progression in the transitional zone are always highly dependent on lead placement, okay? Always keep that in mind, okay? I know it's, we're not applying it here, but with your other EKGs, make sure you know if you see an abnormality with R wave progression or transitional zone that it's highly lead placement uh, related, okay? So let's go to our final interpretation. So we have an irregularly irregular rhythm, okay? We said the rate was 105 beats per minute, and we couldn't make out any clear atrial or atrial ventricular uh, activity, all of which suggest, suggests that we're dealing with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, or RVR. IV conduction is prolonged, which is likely due to the complete right bundle branch block that we saw, okay, and that resulted in those secondary STT abnormalities. We also noted the PVC, or aberrantly conducted complex, all right, that fifth one, as well as the prolonged QTC interval. And of note, when compared to a previous EKG, the only difference was an increase in ventricular rate by 43 beats per minute on this most recent one. You always wanna make sure that you look back at an old EKG, if available, to look for any changes uh, from the most recent one in past recordings, okay? So let's write what we have, what we saw here. Okay, so let's just erase some of this. 
and make our final interpretation, we said that we have AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular response, because our rate is fast. Okay, we also mentioned that we had the PVC uh, versus the aberrantly conducted complex. And that fifth beat. And we also mentioned that we have um, complete right bundle branch block. Okay, with uh, we have the secondary. Okay, let's write this here: secondary ST T wave abnormalities. Okay, and lastly, we mentioned on this that we have a prolonged. QTC interval. Okay, we mentioned it was 504 milliseconds in this gentleman. All right, and then we mentioned that when we compare it to the previous EKG, so compared to the previous um, ECG, we said that this one has an increase in rate by 43 beats per minute, okay, which puts it over that um, threshold of 100, giving us this RVR, okay? So in conclusion, our 85-year-old male with myasthenia gravis that presents with acute hypoxic respiratory failure has an EKG showing atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, a PVC or aberrantly conducted complex, complete right bundle branch block with secondary STT abnormalities, and a prolonged QTC interval. Well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. Please don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below if you like what we're doing. In fact, many of you have asked how you can help us out. Really, the best way would be to simply subscribe and share this resource with your friends. You get free access to more than 300 videos. There's also a community of over 150,000 of us like-minded individuals on Facebook. So stop over and join the EKG Guys Facebook community. If you need a crash course on EKGs, we launched our new EKG course. Check the link below if you're interested. The original cost is around $100. $150, and I believe I made it less than $20 for a limited time. I may be biased, but after reading nearly every EKG textbook on the market, I think this is by far the best EKG series to take you from the beginner level to a physician level. I've even included our pediatric lectures. Anyways, check it out for yourself. I think you'll really enjoy it, and a number of medical schools and hospitals are beginning to use it. If you are a part of an institution, please contact us because we're giving a limited number of schools and hospitals free access to provide feedback and improve our course. And in that case, you can get the course for free. So leave a comment below and get in touch with us. And of course, check out our brand new website ekg.md, the premier EKG resource for medical professionals, where you can find more lessons and practice. That is www.ekg.md. Last but certainly not least, your feedback is incredibly helpful and your kind words are always an encouragement on those long days. So let us know how we're doing. Thank you again for your support. It is truly appreciated. We're the largest, fastest growing EKG resource in the world.